So welcome back to another edition of the Heart to Heart podcast. And my guest today is Ivor Cummins, who's also known as the Fat Emperor, which I'm obviously going to ask him why he uses that name as well. Uh, but Ivor uh, is a biochemical engineer. He has 30 years in uh, corporate tech problem solving, and he's uh, coming on the show today. And we're really happy to have him here. So Ivor, welcome to the show. Great to be here, Mike. Thanks a lot. So I have to ask you, why do you call yourself the fat emperor? <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, I'll try and do a short version. So basically in 2012, I got some uh, blood tests that were far from ideal. I got very poor answers from three doctors in a row as to how to resolve them and the implications of them. So I researched myself a biochemical background and problem solving root cause. So it only took a few weeks. And I found out everything we were told about cholesterol and fat and all that was essentially incorrect. Uh, but it was a while later on with more research, uh, I was with my wife and we were just chatting and it occurred to me, I love metaphors. So it occurred to me there was a triple layer metaphor. So fat emperor could represent the emperor's new clothes, i.e. all the researchers who knew there was something seriously wrong, but never spoke up. Um, and it could also represent the corporate power that kept the false paradigms alive for decades. And it could also represent the kind of obese, diabetic, kind of poor emperor uh, who, if they only knew what was driving their dysfunction and their appetite, and they knew the truth, they could actually fix it with a low carb or keto diet and get their life back. So it's a triple layer metaphor, the fat emperor. Well, I like it. I like it. It seems like you, uh, you hit a lot of different subjects there really well. So it's good. So, uh, you know, back on onto that subject, though, you know, I like what you said about um, cholesterol. You know, I've been someone who's, um, you know, advocated for, for people, you know, not taking statins and, and, you know, just chatting about, you know, cholesterol in, in general, uh, because, you know, I think that very few people understand it. Um, and, you know, what made you kind of um, think that, you know, we're, we're approaching cholesterol with the wrong strategies and that we should be doing things differently? Right. Well, originally, cholesterol was one of my problems, high cholesterol, apparently, uh, but mainly uh, GGT, the liver enzyme and serum ferritin, the iron loading. But when okay. I began to research, I began to find out that really cholesterol correlated very poorly with outcomes. And that kind of shocked me at the time. I even found studies published from, you know, the 2000s in Europe, which showed that the higher the cholesterol for men and women generally, uh, the lower all-cause mortality over the subsequent decades. So essentially, I was finding out that cholesterol was a correlate. It was kind of correlation, not really causation. And mm -hmm. on deeper study, I found out that Cholesterol is a crucial molecule. It's not about the cholesterol numbers that we use. It's about the quality of your cholesterol particles. And that relates mainly to insulin resistance. So I began to find out that really cholesterol was a classic confounded variable, but also unfortunately a whole industry had sprung up around the statins and the low cholesterol, low fat foods. And I realized, you know, they got something wrong 40 years ago, not through corruption, really, they made mistakes, they fell for the wrong variable. Uh, but then corruption was layered on top of the mess for decades, because of the low fat food industry, the pharma industry, you know, it became more and more corrupt, the paradigm was maintained by essentially corruption, or at least extreme bias. So yeah, cholesterol, if people I always say to people, you don't have to believe me, if you go to the world's top risk algorithms for cardiac risk, 10-year uh, risk for heart attacks, you just put in a guy, 50 years old, put in the numbers, put in a total cholesterol of around 320, right? That's huge. And an LDL will be around 200, which is enormous, okay? Milligrams, American units. Uh, but also put in no hypertension, uh, no family history, no diabetes, right? Put in that mm. guy so he's not insulin resistant. And guess what happens? The five algorithms all put out low risk and uh, no medication. So the world's algorithms actually answer the question. It's not the high cholesterol. It's the other things that correlate with it. Insulin resistance level, leptin resistance, uh, hypertension, yada, yada, yada. So and that's it in brief summary. 
Well, I think that's a really good summary. But, um, you know, one thing I want to point out there, too, is that, like, uh, you know, you mentioned, you know, about how, um, you know, the, the how cholesterol is correlated actually with longevity. And I think that's, you know, very important to note, because even in the Framingham study, you know, the gold standard study, like the people um, that actually had the highest cholesterol tended to actually live the longest, you know, which is, which is ridiculous that, that people don't, don't know that. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy that, you know, people who live the longest have the highest cholesterol, yet we're using that same study to lower people's cholesterol, which is, you know, crazy. And then, you know, coming back again to um, the statins, I know you, you just touched on it briefly there, but I mean, these, these medications, um, you know, they haven't been shown to actually extend life. Like there's lots of, of long-term studies that show that, you know, sure statins have been shown to lower cholesterol. Yes, they've been shown to do that, but they don't, uh, they don't, you know, tend to extend, extend life. Is that what you've seen in your research as well? Broadly, yeah. I mean, I've gotten a lot of arguments around the various drug classes, including statins. I try not to go too heavy into the arguments. I'm more interested in fixing the real root causes of heart disease. But the reality is statins, there's a lot of noise. The trials done decades ago are very questionable because we know from the Vioxx scandal in 2004, when the world realized that pharmaceutical companies will actually essentially uh, commit fraud in order to sell medications. Uh, and then the laws were changed around trials and it got a lot tighter, especially in Europe. And since then, the statin trials have not really shown much benefit at all. Uh, but if you go by the older trials, they show that they can defer a heart attack by a period that's debatable um, around 30% of cases. So a 30% reduction in heart attacks, but it doesn't eliminate that heart attack. It at best defers it. And some people would argue for not very long a period, but to your point about mortality, it's really just noise. There's no credible evidence of, of significant effects on mortality. And that's probably because any benefit in anti-inflammatory or pleiotropic action of the statin class drugs is probably offset by negative effects of other sorts by cutting off the whole mevalinate pathway, cutting off the GG, cutting off a lot of important biochemicals. So I think statins... You know, a lot of people still take them because they're terrified and they can't take the risk. And that's fair enough. But the reality is, if you want to avoid a heart attack, there's a lot better things you can do with far better data behind them, like reducing your diabetic level, your insulin levels, your glucose, your leptin. All of these things will blow away any benefit of a statin and you can do them yourself. So that's the kind of way I look at it. I mean, it doesn't make sense to me if I had heart risk to go that route because the data is so weak when I know I can go another route and dramatically lower my risk. I mean, it's kind of a no brainer. Yeah, I, I agree with you uh, completely. And, and I want to ask you too about, you know, certain ways that we can, you know, improve our, our cholesterol. But um, before I ask you that, you know, do you find that you, the, the APOB, um, APO um, A1 uh, is, is the best test in terms of cholesterol? Yeah, I'd say it's been pretty much demonstrated that the APOB over APOA1 or kind of your LDL over your HDL is the best predictor of risk generally uh, of that class of metrics. And, you know, people think that the APOB is a much better measure than the LDL and the We'll uh, have to fix this in post. His internet has conked out. Too bad because he sounds great, but we'll need a stable internet. You might have to, well, we'll have to just patiently wait for him to reconnect okay. here. Okay. But if you notice what I just said, the high APOB may or may not reflect risk, but it'll always be because of something else that's not cholesterol. It's a proxy. And the best example are the Catavans are the most celebrated uh, kind of race of people on earth for low heart disease and no calcification, right? So they're best for heart disease. The Americans, you could argue, are pretty much the worst in the world for heart disease. And guess what? The Catavans have the same or higher APOB particle count on average as Americans. 
So you just know that the ApoB is not driving the bus. You can't have the best heart disease people in the world have the same or higher ApoB as the worst and, and think that it's a driving variable. So just you got to be careful with all these cholesterol variables. But as you say, if you use the ratios, either the uh, total over the HDL or your triglyceride over the HDL or ApoB over ApoA1, by using the ratios, you're getting a proxy for insulin resistance mainly. And that's why it makes the ratios predictive because it's not really about the cholesterol. You're looking more at insulin. Okay, so um, that being said, then I would like, what would you uh, say to people? What are like your top tips for improving overall uh, cholesterol profiles and for preventing heart disease and extending longevity, decreasing mortality? Right. Well, okay. Myself and Dr. Jeffrey Gerber, Denver's diet doctor, we wrote Eat Rich, Live Long, went through all the science and all the food stuff. And basically, we have a, a summary that there's a few key things to do. And we call them the kind of the 10 rules. But essentially, you switch to a low carb, uh, healthy fats diet. That's kind of a default. So you switch to meat, fish and eggs and healthy ancestral foods and above ground vegetables that are not too starchy, particularly for someone who already has a metabolic challenge with carbohydrate, which is the majority of American adults. Uh, it's a bit late when you have a problem with your metabolism to go to a high carb, even healthy high carb diet. So, you know, keep it to the vegetables. Uh, and then fasting, we would see as an enormous benefit it's almost like a metabolic workout without actually doing any work. So we say skip meals. Once you go on a low carb, healthy fats diet, you know, your metabolism will get a lot better. You'll become a fat burner and that will enable you to skip meals and that will push you more in the keto zone. And it's just super healthy thing to do. And I think most people know fasting now is linked strongly to longevity. Uh, then we do leave a certain amount of room for what we call the four S's and I'll try and think that I remember them now. So sun, healthy sun exposure without burning is extremely healthy, not just for vitamin D generation, but there's multiple other photo products that evolution has decided the sun will create in us. And they haven't been researched, but I'm sure they're, they're beneficial. Uh, supplements, modern foods are missing in many cases, magnesium and other elements. And it's no harm supplementing with a few key things. And then stress and sleep. So sleep more and more we're seeing as hugely connected to uh, long-term health and longevity. And I know it's a hard thing to do if you've got a stressful job, but managing stress and getting good sleep uh, are really, really beneficial extras. So I think if you, if you do those things, you're going to be miles ahead uh, of anyone around you in, in terms of achieving health. Yeah, I really too like what you said about about sleep because I think that sleep is very uh, underrated. Um, you, <clears throat> I chatted on the podcast before about just by having one poor night of sleep, they've shown that you're actually more likely to eat more calories the next day. You know, so um, you know a lot of people don't really think that you know sleep is correlated with their with their health or with their body composition. You know, all they think about is is diet and, and exercise. Um, but, you know, sleep, I think, is, is also, you know, one of the pillars of, of health and in terms of metabolic health, which is what we're you know, discussing today. Um, and I think, you know, everyone should be trying to aim for, you know, seven to eight hours of sleep, of sleep every night. So, you know, very happy um, that you made that point. And then in terms of um, the fasting, Ivor, um, is there a certain window that you like to um, uh, go to? Like, is it 16 and 8, 20 and 4? Like, what do you feel is, you know, um, sort of like most ideal? And for myself, for example, like I'm usually between, you know, 14 to 16 hours, probably five, maybe six days a week. You know, I don't go hard, hardcore. Some people like, and I know some people do, you know, 20 and 4, you know, seven days a week. It's like, what do people you know, have to do in order to sort of see the benefits in terms of uh, the metabolic benefits in terms of fasting, how long and how often would you recommend? Yeah, well, I think there's, there's no clear answer on that, but I'll give an overview of what, what I perceive. So I do 24, uh, which is skipping breakfast and just having a lunch and dinner or 
more and more regularly, I'm doing OMAD, OMAD, one meal a day, and I eat once a day. And that sounds unusual to a lot of people, but I find it trivially easy to get out of bed, have a coffee, and work right through the day and enjoy my meal around 6 p.m. And that's what I do most days now. Uh, I do kind of hear anecdotally that men appear to find it easier to fast than women, and there may be evolutionary reasons for that or whatever. But I think 24 I would aim for. And I like the idea of skipping breakfast because you get up, you get a coffee, and you get straight into your day. And you're almost for free getting a longer fast because you've already had the fast overnight by default, and you simply extend it. So I think 24 would be the sweet spot. And I personally go for the uh, one meal a day and it just suits me perfectly. Okay, excellent. Yeah, because we had um, <clears throat> Dave Asprey on, on the, path, on the uh, podcast here recently. And, and he actually said that, you know, fasting out of all the things that he does, all the biohacking stuff that he does um, is the number one thing in terms of extending longevity and extending life. So, you know, really happy to hear that you... Um, that you mentioned that and then yeah very interesting too that you mentioned about the sun and i've looked into that you know before as well um just because you know i feel that you know particularly as, as a canadian who doesn't get you know a, a ton of sun um you know particularly in the winter time i just feel so much better when i'm in the sun and if it was you know just from the vitamin d then i would get that same feeling you know just from taking vitamin d which which i don't get you know, so uh, I agree with you that, you know, there's something more to the sun. And, you know, I don't think uh, we have all the research teased out yet. But, you know, I'm really looking forward to seeing what research has come up with because I think there's, you know, a lot more, a lot more to it. Um, that now, Actually, there's one quick thing, though, all the other photo products that are generated in the sun that you don't get from a D-pill, we don't have the data on those. But one thing we do have solid is uh, nitric oxide. And, you know, the UVA causing vasodilation and lower blood pressure. So that's a real quite dramatic effect uh, for the period after sun exposure. And that, and that may tie into the feel good factor, too. But that that one's well researched. OK, and, and uh, before I ask you about COVID, you know, just because we're, we're on the topic of of the sun and, and heat, um, or I guess more so just just on the sun. Um, you know, I just want to ask you too about like, uh, cooling methods and saunas. Like, do you believe in what like Wim Hof is doing? Like, do you, do you believe that saunas have, you know, also a ton of benefits for, for metabolic health? I know, you know, Rhonda Patrick's talks about saunas quite a bit and, uh, you know, that that's been a topic of interest for a lot of people listening, uh, uh, recently. So just wondering about your opinion on that. Yeah, Mike, well, that one is, and I'm always upfront and honest, I have not researched it much. I've observed Wynne and Rhonda's stuff and others, and the basic kind of glance through the data and the evidence for me, I'd be fully supportive. Uh, to be honest, I don't make an effort to do that, but I, I'm sure it has benefits. I just couldn't quantify them. But the heat shock proteins and all these mechanisms that are brought up and all the other peripheral evidence... I mean, I'd say it's great stuff to do. Uh, I don't quite go there. I do the diet. I do the fasting. I get the sun. I'm, I may be doing the easier stuff in a sense, yeah. but but yeah, uh, I, it sounds great. And it's so far it checks out for me. It's authentic. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so many things you can do for for your health that like you know, uh, it's it's difficult to do all of them. Like some people will do, you know, a sauna, an IV drip, you know, a workout a healthy diet, you know, to sleep, sleep well, take the right supplements. Um, you know, you can always add other things. If you're injured, you can go see a masseuse, you know, there's so many different things you can do throughout your day. So it's kind of hard to, to, to fit them all in. So I definitely um, agree with you on that. Um, but, you know, since we are talking about uh, metabolic health and it is a pandemic and we know that, you know, poor metabolic health is associated with, with COVID. Um, and I know that you've uh, written quite a bit on that um, recently, Ivor. So, you know, how do you feel metabolic health um, ties into COVID and, you know, what are we not doing and what we should and what should we be doing to, you know, improve our metabolic health so that we can decrease our rates of infection, uh, hospitalization and deaths from, from COVID? Yeah, I think it's a huge thing. I mean, I, I interviewed Dr. Ron Rosedale, believe it or not, on April 11, 2020. 
that early and we went through all of this in detail and he's just a genius when it comes to leptin insulin and he went through all the mechanisms by which leptin resistance particularly and leptin is a cytokine and it's way more than just a fat released hormone related to appetite uh, it's intricately linked into the immune system and the reality is that insulin resistance leptin resistance which is a modern absolute epidemic and i'll give one figure for the us it's acknowledged 2015 i think that around 66 percent of adult americans above the age of 45 are either pre-diabetic or diabetic now that's insulin and leptin resistant so two-thirds at least just using glucose measures of adults have this metabolic problem that's a massive multiplier for risk uh, of severe outcome from COVID. I mean, this is so obvious. And we saw out of China, I mean, literally back in March, the data came out of China, 10 times risk for elevated age, that relates to insulin resistance, we, it increases with age, 10 time risk for COPD, insulin resistant related state, diabetes, 10 times risk. So, you know, we had the data from February 2020, and then we saw the vitamin D studies, many of them that were coming out last May, June, July. And vitamin D was not really related to not catching it, but it was massively related to severity of outcome. So again, you were talking at 10 times more severe outcome or risk of death broadly for people below 30 nanogram versus above. And it scaled line linearly. We saw Northern Italy get hammered. They're the vitamin D black spot of Europe. We saw Japan get away with murder. They're elderly of some of the highest vitamin D levels in the world. Uh, so we saw all the data coming in saying, if we got the, I was saying at the time, if we took the whole population and magically before SARS-CoV-2 hit, we only had meat, fish and eggs and vegetables available in the food supply. A few weeks of only being able to eat meat, fish, and eggs and vegetables, uh, and then you allow SARS-CoV-2 to hit, it would have had massively lower impact because it only takes a few weeks. And that was Dr. Ron Rolsdale's point. It only takes a few weeks of fixing the drivers of leptin resistance for the body to recover enormously and for the immune system to be functioning vastly better again. It doesn't take a year or two. We know this, we see diabetes type two reversal in many people, literally within weeks, sometimes within one week. So it's a tragedy. I thought back in 2020, well, at least this is gonna focus the world on metabolic health, but what happened? Zero focus on metabolic health, denial of metabolic health connections effectively, and an utter 100% obsession with lockdowns, which scientifically we've seen have very little effect, and masks similarly. So the world decided they didn't want to know about the solution, uh, but they did have solutions that they were very excited about, lockdowns and masks. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you that, you know, this was an opportunity for us to focus on, you know, uh, creating better health, and creating a, a society that would, um, you know, follow you know particular health instructions, and they just weren't given out. And as a consequence, you know, people are still you know eating the same garbage and you know living the same lifestyle as they were previously. Whereas you know this could have been you know a perfect opportunity for the world to really step up and you know take care of their own health. Uh, and, and to learn, you know, how they can improve their own health and to also, you know, do it themselves, you know, instead of relying on the government and relying on, you know, the, the, these mandates that they have, um, you know, put out for us like lockdowns, you know, we should be relying on our own health and our own um, immune system. Um, and just coming back to that, you know, there's, there's probably quite a few people listening to this who understand, you know, insulin um, resistance, but I think there's probably some people who aren't familiar with, with leptin and leptin resistance. And I was just wondering if you could just go back um, and chat about that briefly, Ivor. Right. Well, yeah. So insulin resistance put most simply is, and there's many drivers, I would say vegetable, modern vegetable oils, refined carbohydrates and sugars. You know, that devil's triad that makes up ultra processed food, 
that's one of the main drivers. But lack of exercise and other challenges and lack of sun uh, can also contribute. So basically, it's the state where your insulin levels rise to deal with your blood glucose when you're piling in glucose, you know, and then the other half of your physiology has to resist insulin's action, you know, be responding to it. And then insulin rises higher to overcome that resistance. So it's a classic vicious cycle I went through back in 2012, in my first lectures. So that's insulin resistance. And you end up with high insulin and high glucose, which should never happen, and high free fatty acids in your blood. So that's a, a, a complete machine breakdown when you've all three high. Uh, but that is the state of insulin resistance. And it damages all the vessels, the capillaries. It damages neurological circuits. It damages everything. That's the type 2 diabetes horror in the world today. Now, leptin is a fat uh, stored hormone. And when your fat levels go up and you become very fat, your leptin levels will go up. And in a working machine or in a working human machine, higher leptin will lower your appetite. It kind of signals we've got long-term fat stores. You can stop eating, buddy. But the tragedy is, and it's the same with insulin and appetite, when you become insulin resistant or leptin resistant, leptin and insulin no longer work properly for their function of lowering appetite. Uh, they actually begin to not work at all. So leptin resistance people can consider it as almost equivalent to insulin resistance. They go together, two sides of a coin. But the problem with leptin resistance, it ha has all of its own dysfunctions, like appetite control, etc. So it just adds to the milieu. Um, so that's, that's kind of leptin put simply. Uh, leptin is a measurement you can easily get. I got it in the US a few years ago. Uh, you want leptin, like insulin, to be low. Mine came in as with an asterisk. In other words, it was so low compared to the population, the machine figured, okay, that's a bit odd, but that's a good oddness. And you can also get adiponectin, which is another fat storage hormone, which you want really high. Insulin sensitive people have high adiponectin. And as it happened, I got a 21 with an asterisk because my adiponectin was apparently too high compared to the average person. So low leptin, high adiponectin, low insulin, low glucose. If you just follow those four measures and push them where they need to be, I mean, you're going to be in the stratosphere ahead of people around you. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's really good for people to know. And, and you know, it's, I'm happy that you mentioned all that because people do want to, you know, probably get their own blood work tested and they want to know like what specifically to, to look for. Um, but also to, you know, you made a really good point and, you know, I chatted about uh, this with uh, another um, uh, doctor recently who was on my podcast, but coming back to um, insulin resistance and, and, and fixing it quickly, you know, there's been um, a lot of people who have, you know, talked about how obesity is is linked to, um, you know, poor outcomes in COVID, and uh, you know that is the case. But basically, more or less, from what I've seen, is that it's really, um, you know, diseases that are associated with with obesity that's causing the poor outcomes in COVID. And so, you know, someone who's a hundred pounds overweight and has, you know, really poor insulin resistance. They, when they see someone, you know, put on, on their Twitter or Instagram that, you know, obesity is linked to, you know, poor outcomes in COVID, they think, oh my God, you know, if I don't lose a hundred pounds or if I don't lose 50 pounds, you know, I'm going to succumb to COVID. I'm going to be the ones that, that gets hospitalized and dies. But what you're saying is that, you know, they don't necessarily need to lose all that weight. I mean, obviously we encourage people to, to lose weight. Um, but you know, what we're, what we can do in the short term quickly to decrease risk. And, and this can be done fairly quickly is to decrease some of those risk factors like insulin resistance, which can be fixed a lot more quickly. Is that, you know, one of the points that you're, you, you're trying to make? That that's a huge point, Mike. And I'll just, I go a little aside to, to just go through something that I think is just phenomenal. One of my favorite research papers of all time and I have around 3,000 of my hard drives, so that's saying something, is entitled Insulin-Sensitive Obesity. I think it's just a three-word title. 
And what it shows is they had supersized guys, 45 BMI, and they did all their blood work and they separated them into the insulin sensitive obese, which they called metabolically healthy obese, MHO, and the insulin resistance obese, which will be most of them when they're BMI 45. But the reality was that the 45 BMI mega guys who are insulin sensitive, all of their blood work reflected a healthy metabolism. And the reality is most people, when they become very obese, they're gonna be highly insulin resistant and their body is trying to make extra fat to store this energy. But some lucky people, metabolically healthy obese, they are able to expand their subcutaneous adipose tissue safely and their body is still able to be metabolically working very well while being enormous. Now, they're a minority, but they prove a point. They prove the point that it's not the obesity per se that's the risk factor. It's just that it correlates with metabolic health. And it's a bit like the cholesterol. It's not the high cholesterol that's a problem, but it can often correlate with insulin resistance. It's the same kind of uh, trickery. So yeah, someone who is obese and metabolically healthy is not really at extra risk from COVID. Someone who's obese and insulin resistant, who, I who is very unhealthy, they only need to lose probably 10 pounds, 15 pounds by switching to the right stuff we described earlier. And that's going to come out of their visceral fat in their organs. That's where it's going to come out first, where the dysfunction is. So they will plummet their risk long before their body weight substantially lowers. So yeah, that's, that's the reality. And if people knew that and knew how to track it with blood measures like insulin and leptin and adiponectin, uh, boom, you know, everyone could take control of their own health and, uh, that would just blow away all of the ineffective measures that our governments have pushed. Blow that's, it away. Yeah, and that's that's an excellent point. And it's excellent for people to hear that because again, you know, there's there's people who are, you know, probably thinking that they need to lose a ton of weight. And of course, we encourage you to lose any unhealthy weight, mm. but you know, uh focus on improving your insulin resistance first, and then that'll kind of you know decrease your risk of uh of, of chronic disease and, and from acquiring COVID. Um, and then also too, Ivor, uh, I'm sure you've probably seen in some of your in some of your research that again, you know, another um, disease that is associated with with obesity is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And you know, one of the um, studies that I've seen, or a couple of studies now that I've seen, have shown that you know it's not necessarily again the obesity that's making people more at risk for COVID, but non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Uh, and people who are obese that are uh, at risk for COVID. Have you come across anything in your research that indicates the same thing? Uh, oh, absolutely. And that would be that would be core. So I mentioned like the visceral fat or the intraorganal fat. Well, exactly falling into that bracket is the fatty liver. And what people need to realize is we have an absolute epidemic of fatty liver now, including in the young in America. And the vast majority is not related to alcohol because we used to have alcoholic fatty liver disease, cirrhosis, etc. The vast majority of liver disease now is not alcohol. It's sugar, carb and vegetable oil and juice, processed food, right? Uh, so, yeah, stripping out the fat from the liver is rapid when you switch to what we described. And like fatty liver disease, it's just uh, what can I say? It's it's an epidemic. It's incredible. Yeah. And if you go from being fatty liver disease person to non fatty liver disease person. Now, if you have cirrhosis, it's a bit like if you have stage four kidney uh, disease, it's hard to reverse all of that once it's cirrhotic. But if you have the classic fatty liver disease, which is the buildup of fat and lipids in your liver, that can be reversed so fast. I mean, there's some shocking uh, examples we've had. I have one doctor, and I, I just have to say this one. Last March, I was in Denver at a conference. I was speaking, and it was just when the corona thing blew up. And a guy came, a very heavy gentleman uh, of Asian extraction, Indian, uh, came running over to me and gave me a bear hug. And he said, Ivor, you saved my life. And I went, oh, okay. <laughs> but he was an internal medicine doctor, an MD. And he said, basically, he got our book eight months previously, and he had lost already uh, something like 40 pounds. And he was still big, but 
you know, he used to be really big. And we were laughing. And then he said, guess how long it took me either to reverse my diabetes with, with what you and Dr. Gerber have been saying. And I said, okay, um, you're going to say like just a few weeks, I guess. And he said, 11 days. So in 11 days, he redid his insulins. And he was down from shocking levels of type 2 diabetic. He was type 2 diabetic for 10 years. In 11 days, his insulin had plummeted down to a level which you could accept to not represent type 2 diabetes anymore. And his glucose followed. But that's a doctor, right? Who just read a book. Look what he did. He put his diabetes in remission in a week or two. And that's just with changing his diet. Was that, is that right? Yeah, I mean... well. People- on, on, people really underestimate the power of diet, but sorry, go ahead, Ivor. Oh yeah, no, I, I, I'll be honest and truthful. He said our book and our book did include all the stuff. So I would guess he did the diet, rapidly started skipping meals. And I guess he threw the book at it, uh, but probably hadn't done any supplements, son or anything like that. Certainly not in 11 days. So it was just diet and probably some meal skipping that got him the remission of diabetes. And we have an Irish company now, Redicare, and they are getting in two small human studies, 50 to 70% of their people with type two diabetes have put it in remission and it's maintained long-term uh, in their studies. And Verta's done the same. So we have all the published data now, a disease that supposedly is chronic and you cannot stop it and it's progressive, it will always get worse you can actually put it in remission and massively improve it for most people or all people uh, just with diet. Redicare just do diet. They don't actually even in those trials do anything but real food diets. Now, they're low carb diets, but they don't use the low carb word because in Ireland, low carb is seen as fringe. So they just call it real food diets, but they're all low carb, right? The recipes. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, and just on that note too, to get a little bit um, more specific, Ivor, um, how many you know grams of carbs a day or grams of, of carbs per, per body weight are you um, are you are you talking about with regards to these diets? Yeah, well, so you kind of use net carbs because if you've got like you know a hundred grams of broccoli, I mean a lot of those grams are not carbohydrate. Uh, but if you use, people can Google it, but if you use net carbs, we generally say a low carb diet around 80 grams a day, you okay. know, around 20% of your calories from carb. And if you've got diabetes issues or you have neurological challenges or, you know, specific uh, kind of very embedded metabolic problems, you may have to go down to 40 and even down to the hard keto of 20. Uh, yeah. But to be honest, it's, it's a personalized thing. Many people switching to a nominal 80 gram low carb diet will, will get such amazing benefits that they'll just stay there. And people can push further into the really low carb keto hard fasting space. But that becomes almost more like a little bit like a medical intervention. So myself and Dr. Gerber say, do the low carb, stick to it and then skip meals to achieve the keto rather than eating sticks of butter and going ultra low carb. We're just a little less comfortable with advocating that kind of hard keto in a very general way. Yeah, and, and for people listening to who wanna you know, experience um, ketosis, also too, I mean, vigorous exercise is, is gonna help you get there you know, a, a lot faster as well. So, and so if you are you know, someone who exercises a ton and you know, that can vary so much, you know, if, I mean, I think I exercise a ton, but not compared to someone like David Goggins. So, you know, we can, uh, you can get away with a few more carbs per day um, and, and, and be, and still have, you know, a really great metabolism and fantastic metabolic health if you exercise. But if you're someone who's, you know, pretty sedentary, um, you know, then, then you're probably going to want to eat less. And I use that too. Like if I have a day where, you know, I've done like a ridiculous amount of exercise, um, then, you know, I may eat a few more carbs that day or that night. Whereas, you know, if I have a day where, you know, it's very rarely I I don't work out in in a day, but if that does happen, then, you know, I'm definitely going to eat less um, overall that day. 
Um, and I love your approach, Ivor, of, uh, you know, focusing on food first. I think that's what we should be doing. Um, but one thing that I did come across in some research, um, although it's fairly uh, um, preliminary, is um, spirulina does seem to be pretty effective for reducing overall liver fat. I'm not sure if that's something that you've um, come across before, but there was a couple studies done anyway that, and they even, you know, had uh, ultrasounds on this too, showing that it can, it can decrease liver fat, but it was a case series a few years ago that, that I saw. I was just wasn't sure if you, if you, uh, you know, came across that. And again, we're, I'm, I'm advocating for diet first over, over supplements. Yeah, I've come across it, but again, I'm not as focused on supplements generally. And although it rings a bell, I, I would have, I would tend not to go down and check out everything, but, okay. but again, it's probably my bias towards the core supplements like the magnesium, the potassium, you know, the K2, uh, the D3, if you can't get the sun or you can't get lamps, you know, I kind of have a cluster of, of basics and the diet and then the exercise and then the sleep and all that. And I suppose, yeah. There's a lot of in L-arginine is, is talked about a lot. I've, I've looked into that, you know, and, and maybe the spirulina, but I haven't yet. I probably don't, haven't had the bandwidth really to follow up every uh, furrow. <laughs> okay. I understand. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's so many supplements um, out there. It was just uh, something that I, that I came across and sort of related to, to the combo, but um, just getting back to COVID a little bit and some of the measures, you know, um, you know, we chatted just very, very briefly about lockdowns and how they're, you know, largely, you know, ineffective. And, you know, what data have you seen that that's shown that, you know, the lockdowns are, are mostly ineffective and why do you feel that it's such a, a poor strategy for, for, for preventing um, COVID? Yeah. I mean, you just, had, everyone talks about the science, but most of them are talking nonsense, unfortunately. So what you need to do is you can't cherry pick and I always tell people a key thing, Professor Karl Popper, and it's about the asymmetry of proof. And I'll, I'll try and describe it. So if you have a hypothesis that lockdowns are really effective, let's say, you don't need lots of examples where they're not. You only need one. So one good example of a black swan or a negative piece of evidence against a hypothesis kills it. But you can have 20 positive correlations that support it but but they don't really help so that's what popper brought to us a long time ago the power of negative evidence is much more powerful than simply affirmative or positive so the people who like lockdowns they pick examples of countries where they did a lockdown and it happened to coincide with a curl over but what they don't realize is that's worthless evidence the only powerful evidence is a country that did no lockdown and had the exact same experience. That ends the hypothesis about lockdowns being effective. Now, luckily, I can send you a link, but we have myriad examples of negative evidence. So we have way more than we ever need to disprove the effectiveness of lockdowns. I actually have 45 published papers, articles, and studies uh, in that single link which all show lockdown does not have scientific support to really change the curve. I even have a paper that models, and it's a fantastic paper, and it actually shows that if you flatten the curve somewhat with lockdown, if you achieve that, you'll actually cause higher death in the long run in the next season because you'll have limited somewhat community immunity in the healthy, and that will put granny at risk. So the irony is the people who push lockdowns and accuse someone like me of not caring about granny, the irony is they're the ones with blood on their hands. Because not only have you got the effect I just mentioned, that's COVID death made higher in the long run. But the negative effect on public health and, and mortality of lockdowns beyond COVID is enormous. My most recent study is a Canadian professor, and he looked at life years lost, and he estimated 280 times more life years will be lost because of lockdowns than were ever saved from COVID by the lockdowns. 
I saw yeah. that, that paper actually. It was but done by an economist, I think. But sorry, go ahead. Um, if you can uh, chat about it a little bit more, Ivor, because I, I I I read it, you know, briefly. But you know, it seems like you've uh, you've kind of d delved into it a little bit more. So go ahead. Well, again, he made certain assumptions, but what's key is he looked at life years lost rather than just number of deaths, because if COVID kills people at an average age around life expectancy, it'll have very limited life years lost, whereas lockdowns can affect the death of people of all ages, some of whom had 40 years left or 32 years left. So you must look at life years, not just deaths. Um, now, he may be a bit high on the, his assumptions, in fairness, but 280 times, my estimate is probably lockdowns have a 100 to 1 negative cost benefit on average measured over years. Yeah, probably 100 to 1 in terms of and that's not even including the atrocious, abominable, disgraceful, totalitarian nature of these lockdowns and what it's done to our freedoms and the health of our democracy. And it's actually caused psychological damage to the majority because the majority now for a full year have been told lockdowns work. They've, they're told that masks work. They're told that they'll kill granny. Do you see what's happened? We've psychologically damaged the majority of our free Western dem democratic people. So, so the price of lockdown is beyond imagining. And the benefit, as we know from the 45 papers, if there's a benefit there, it's small enough that you can't measure it. So think about that, guys. The benefit of lockdown is small enough that you can't really even measure it after a full year and 200 countries analyzed by scientific teams. They can't find it. Guess why? Because it ain't really there. Yeah, I, I've never thought that, you know, lockdowns were, were the answer, the solution to, to the COVID pandemic. You know, I've always thought it's about been about us, you know, refocusing on our health, refocusing on our on our metabolic health, you know, taking vitamin D and doing things that, you know, we know that have evidence that have been shown to uh, prevent and, and treat COVID, which unlike lockdowns, you know, we don't. And then, you know, the consequences too, I mean, you know, the things that we're talking about, Ivor, like sleep and vitamin D, like you should be doing those things anyway. You know, like if you're, if, if you want to have healthy testosterone levels, it's, it's, it's imperative that you have, you know, a good vitamin D level and that you sleep well at night, you know, and, uh, and, you know, these things are things that we should be doing anyways. But, you know, you look at the consequences of, of lockdowns. And I mean, you know, we're saying that, like, you know, there's basically no evidence for benefit but there's plenty of evidence for risk. I mean, it's, 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 it's unreal. I mean, there's been, you know, two to three times uh, the amount of phone calls, like kids help phone. I'm sure you saw that stat. Um, you know, there's been more suicides. Uh, there's been more um, overdoses from opioids and other, you know, uh, substances of abuse. So, you know, there's people are sort of acting like, you know, there's no like trade off here. And, you know, it'd be easier to, to accept, say, if, you know, there was a massive benefit to the lockdowns. But if you look at the risk benefit ratio of lockdowns, um, you know, it looks like, as you, as you said, you know, it might be a hundred to one. And yeah, like that, that uh, research paper, I don't think that's been um, peer reviewed yet. But still, you know, it was, uh, it was a well done, you know, paper overall. And, uh, you know, I think that future research is going to, to look at that. But I mean, even if you're way off, like even if it's, if it's not 100 to 1, even if it's 10 to 1, I mean, that's still a, a, a very, very, very poor decision. But, you know, to your point, you know, it easily could be 100 to 1. You know, only I guess time will, will tell. You know, we definitely do need, you know, more studies on that um, so we can get a better answer. Um, so, you know, Ivor, I wish we had more time today. You know, I know that, uh, we only have a couple minutes left. I'm sure, you know, people are listening are going to want to know where they can find you. So, um, can you, uh, let people know, you know, where they can find you online and, uh, we'll kind of go from there. 
Yeah, no, great. Great, Mike. Really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, if you search um, my name, Ivor Cummins, you'll quickly get my YouTube. I mean, subscribe, hit the bell. I put out a ton of interviews with professors all over the world, metabolic health, COVID, everything, and my own presentations, and they're all free. So YouTube's probably my main engine, though I'm on Odyssey and BitChute as well, just in case. A lot of censorship these days. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> and then also my fatemperor.com uh, website, thefatemperor.com, you'll see. And there you can sign up to the email list, which is also a good thing because you never know these days, again, with censorship. So uh, that's probably it. I actually have one other thought. Now, I don't know. You don't want any product plugs on your podcast, do you? Or, or is it okay to mention it's a product? It's okay to plug. I, I, don't, I don't mind. Go ahead. Okay, so I will just show you because we talked about sleep. This is the Whoop device, W-H-O-O-P, whoop.com. And it is $30 a month, so it's not for people with very tight resources. And I got a lot of criticism about promoting this. I promoted it because I love it. I live by it in the last six, seven weeks. But a lot of people are concerned that the data goes to the cloud. So I appreciate people sometimes don't like their data. I, I don't care about my heart data and sleep data, but some people do. But the thing is, I can send you a link with a, a discount and it just gives you everything every morning. Your heart rate variability, your sleep quality, your REM sleep, your uh, deep sleep, your light sleep, your waking moments, your recovery for that day and whether you should train or rest. It's just, I find it unreal. And a cardiologist, Nadir Ali, who's a brilliant researcher, he's massive into sleep research. And I got the tip from him six weeks ago. He said, whoop is number one. The aura ring is kind of number two. Yeah, he said Fitbit's number 10. So anyway, I can send you a link with a discount, but I, I just think it's amazing. And anytime I, I'm not good at night or I have a few too many wines or I'm not behaving the next morning. The whoop tells you, by God, it's stunning. And if you do the right stuff, you get a beautiful report in the morning. So it's very motivational to stay on track. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for mentioning that. I've looked into, um, you know, the aura ring before, but it sounds like you're going to have to look into the whoop because I, uh, I'd love to, you know, track my sleep and my heart rate variability. Um, but again, you know, thank you so much for coming on. Ivor. you know, you shared a, a wealth of knowledge with us today and gave, uh, you know, so many helpful tips that I think people can, you know, implement right away. So thank you so much for, for coming on. And uh, I'll definitely be asking you to come back on another time. Great stuff, Mike. Anytime. Bye now. Bye.